Hi, uh, welcome to Mind Tip. This is a little bit unusual. I'm not sitting in a studio, as you can see. Um, I'm sitting in my lounge, and we're carrying on the teaching this way because the uh, world has taken some really strange turns lately, and uh, we don't want to stop the learning. So here's me, Philip Jubey, and I'm coming to you from my lounge. Today, we're going to be taking a look at some topics that are still organic chemistry related. We're going to be taking a look at organic properties, and I'm obviously going to be theming it around COVID-19, the virus that's spreading around the world and has got many of you in a similar situation to me, stuck inside the house. And um, hopefully we can carry on the learning together, decrease the fear, and hopefully once this is all over, we can kind of carry on with things again. So uh, get a pen and paper, um, get your notepad. This is for anyone that is studying organic chemistry or is into life sciences, um, or even if you're just interested into how science is affecting um, you know, the study of this virus. Let's take a look. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna see how we can use organic chemistry to fight uh, COVID-19. That is the virus, and this picture is the one that many of you have seen on many of the blogs doing the rounds on the internet. And uh, you've been told many things on how to protect yourself, and I'm going to make sense of why we need to do those things to protect ourselves. Well, firstly, um, we need to take a look at the science. So the science behind this is really, really important. We need to know how the virus looks, how it functions in order to be able to attack it. And we're going to use what we know about the properties of organic chemistry, or at least the molecules, to be able to fight this virus. Okay, so most of you have uh, kind of got a vague idea of what a virus is, and just to separate it from other sicknesses that you might get, uh, viruses and bacteria are two very different microparticles. A virus is essentially a non-living particle until it gets into your body and there it takes over your normal cellular me mechanics and there it uses your own cells to multiply itself. It uses your cells as a photostat machine. So how does it do that? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of complicated, but there are three main elements to this virus that I want to attach. Um, here, there is one piece that I want to look at. There's a ring around the outside that I want to look at and there's a ring on the inside. First, there's the proteins on the outside. Now, these proteins are what allow this virus to uh, attach to the cells inside your respiratory system. They uh, have a very, very particular shape. And what you'll find is that they link up with these ACE2 receptors. You don't need to know that, but it's just really interesting that there's uh, proteins which match the, the virus particles that live inside your throat, mouth, lungs, and this allows the virus to attach. Now that's the first stage. Now what happens is that this virus has got this protective layer. So they say study your enemy to be able to defeat it. And this is the really important bit on the outside. That is a lipid capsule. Okay, now this lipid capsule is what's gonna give us a chance to fight this virus because this lipid capsule for those of you doing biology, you know what a lipid is, but for the rest of you, that is a fat or an oil. So fat or an oil around this virus is what protects the contents of the virus. Now, what is inside the virus? Now, that's less important unless you're doing life sciences. That is called RNA. Okay, so this is an RNA virus. Okay, it's very similar to DNA. RNA is roughly half the size of DNA but it still contains a lot of genetic material. This is where the virus keeps all the information to be able to make more of itself. Once it gets onto a cell, it puts that RNA into your cell and makes your cell into um, a photocopy machine for these viruses. So you make a whole bunch of these viruses and unfortunately that's how the virus spreads. So how can we attack these? Well, one thing we can do is we can attack the proteins or we can attack the lipid or we can attack the RNA. Now, attacking the RNA is really difficult because this virus is well protected. It lives on surfaces for a long time. Uh, proteins, quite difficult. Heat does help a little bit. UV light can help a little bit. But uh, the most effective way of fighting this virus is to wash your hands. Now, when you are washing your hands, it's really, really important to do two things. First of all is to get complete coverage of your hands with the soap. The soap itself is actually the antiviral. Uh, so just to make sure not just to rub your hands like that, rubbing on the backs of both and rubbing out your thumbs and scrubbing underneath the nails. Now you've got to expose all of the virus to the soap. 
and also for long enough. That's why they say you need to sing some sort of song while you're busy washing your hands. It's to get that time for the soap to act on the virus lipid particles. Okay, so let's see why we need to wash our hands with soap. Now, here's the thing, is that soaps themselves, now this is something I didn't know too much about before I started reading up on it, so we're learning together, is that soaps themselves are able to attack this lipid layer on the outside here. Now, just the same way that they stick to an oil particle on a pan that you're trying to wash, soaps are able to open up this virus capsule and that breaks open the virus and uh, that means that the air and everything else can attack the virus on the inside. So if I've got a soak here and I break up that lipid layer, I've destroyed the virus and it means that it cannot get into your cells, it cannot replicate. Um, so washing hands is pretty amazing. The reason that soaps are so amazing is that soaps are able to stick to wa water and oil at the same time. So if I've got a pan, let's just draw a really bad pan. There we go. So we've got a pan and on the surface of your pan, you've got a droplet of oil. A droplet of oil usually sticks up there and detergents are able to come and stick into that oil and also stick to good old H2O. The reason that's so important is because it allows H2O to hold onto the fat droplet because soap can talk polar and non-polar. So there's a really important principle at play here is that like dissolves like. Now water is polar and oil is non-polar. So soaps have a non-polar part that sticks into the oil and a polar part which sticks into the water. And here's how you're gonna attack this virus. It's, it's allowing the soap to go inside there and actually break up the lipid by sticking in the same way that it does into an oil droplet on a pan. So if you've got greasy hands, soap is your friend. And those non-polar tails of soap are able to go inside there. And also if you've got virus on your hands, exactly the same story. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna see how the virus is ripped open by um, the soap itself. And that is to do with the way that soap has got this polar part and this non-polar part. And there's another method as well that we can commonly use against this virus, and that is to use sanitizer. Now, most of you have taken a look at some sanitizer. Most of you have seen people using sanitizer. Uh, please make sure that you buy the one that has got more than 70% ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, because you need a very, very high percentage of alcohol because the alcohol itself is the thing which is gonna kill this virus, and you need a very high concentration of it to be able to do that. So alcohol is also less polar than water, and that allows it to go inside and dissolve that fat as well, because very often alcohol is used to clean off fats and uh, oils from things, and alcohol is very effective at doing that. So you need more than 70% ethanol to be able to do that. The question is, why do soaps and why does ethanol actually kill this? We need to take a look at what polarity is, and that's to do with the physical properties of particles. Now, what decides the physical properties, now I'm gonna keep this slide up for a little while because a lot of you are taking notes at home, is there's a few things that come into play when we decide is something going to boil or mix or is it going to melt? Um, it's down to the microscopic particles. So first we need to take a look at microscopic details about the particles and then we need to start to take a look at macroscopic. So macroscopic is the things which you and I can feel and see and taste and touch. So macroscopic is the big scale. So things like uh, temperature, the, the melting point and the boiling point, those are macroscopic properties. But at a microscopic level, we need to take a look at the strength of forces, the shape and the mass of the particles, and obviously, that is gonna have an effect on the macroscopic. Now, before we need to take a look at this, like how do we decide the, the type and the shape of uh, these molecules, deciding if they're polar or not, we need to take a look at what polarity is. This is taking you right back to grade 11. So molecular polarity is to do with where charges build up on a molecule. So <clears throat> polarity is, the first protocol when you're starting to see what type of forces build up on a molecule. 
how strong they are, how much it's going to influence the physical properties of this material. I always use this example when you start to take a look at polarity, and this is HCl. How do I tell if a molecule is polar? Well, first I need to see if the bond is polar. So this is bond between H and Cl. If you take a look at the Lewis dot diagram, and we start to plot this out, you'll notice that there's a sharing of electrons between H and Cl. I hope you remember how to draw these Lewis dot diagrams. Generally, they're not that examinable in grade 12, but there's something really important I want to point out here. H and Cl have got to share these electrons. Now, these electrons are not shared out equally. So what does that mean? Is that one of these two atoms is going to win the fight for those two electrons. It's going to spend more time around one than the other. How do I know? Well, I know that hydrogen is further to the left, further to the metals, and we know that they've got low electronegativities. Now, if you didn't know how to do that, uh, I'd like you to get the periodic table that you've practiced with and see if you can find these numbers. Now, chlorine has got a relatively high electronegativity because it's a non-metal. Hydrogen, also a non-metal, but it's in group one. So the further left you go on the periodic table, the lower this number becomes. Now, I hope you can see that this pull of electrons is different between these two. And that means that chlorine will have a slightly stronger pull of electrons than hydrogen will. Chlorine will keep the electrons for a little bit longer, whereas hydrogen will be left slightly positive. Now that means that the bond is polar. Now there's a couple of other things which come into play before we decide if a molecule is polar, but um, let's just get this part of electronegativity during bonding down, is that when two atoms form a bond between the two, if there's a difference between the electronegativity, there will be a polar bond up to a difference of around about 1.4. So if I took 3.0 and I subtracted from it 2.1, I get an electronegativity difference of 0.9. Now, generally, what you're looking for is 0.4 up to 1.4. That's the range for a polar covalent bond. And uh, you will find that some molecules sometimes are on the edge of that. So, I mean, water, for instance, is close to 1.4, or is exactly 1.4. 1, 1 it's almost an ionic bond, but that's one of the things that makes water so polar. Okay, so uh, before we go to an ad break, what I want to do is just quickly round up what we've studied in this first segment. There's a lot of new terminology. First of all, to decide the properties of an organic molecule, or any molecule for that matter, I need to take a look at the microscopic level and we need to see uh, the types of bonds uh, that occur between molecules and we need to see the shape and the size of those molecules. So that's where we are at the moment. We've figured out inside the molecule, is this bond polar or not? And what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at, well, okay, well, does that add up to a molecular polarity? Okay, so uh, get a little bit of rest, go wash your hands and come back and we'll join you after the break. <laughs> 